invite you to join me in 2 Corinthians today. And if you think I've cruised before and gone fast before, it's okay. Strap on your, your uh, speed of light boots because we're going fast today. I have a lot of things I want to cover, and I won't say a whole lot about everything, but hopefully enough to, 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 so we can hear from God today. So you can, you can begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is where I'm going to be to start with this morning. So last week, we, the message was really geared mostly toward the tithe and giving to the work of the ministry, giving to supply for uh, the workers and the work of the ministry. But today is focused more on the giving of the needs to the saints. One thing that I think is really neglected in terms of giving to the Lord is the idea of giving to his people, all right? And when I look in the book of Acts, we see that in the book of Acts, in, in multiple places, it says they had everything in common. They had, they had stuff that nobody had a need because they were sharing with one another. And what's really interesting is I think of the reason why I think the government has set up a welfare system if you look back in the early history of the church, there was no welfare system because the church was the welfare system. The church took care of its own. And I think what Paul's going to address in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, what we're going to look at this morning, is the idea of giving to the saints. And I don't know how much you've thought about when it comes to our finances. I don't know how much you've ever thought about giving to the saints, giving to other believers. And that's where we're going to go today, because that's part of what it means to give, right? So I want to look at some biblical principles for giving to the saints. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. We're going to move quickly. I'm going to make some points along the way. You've got your um, bulletin insert, okay, to, to work with me. And then I'm going to take us in 1 Corinthians 16 uh, for a couple of verses at the end. So I want us to look at Eight things from 2 Corinthians 8. And I'm not going to be reading the whole chapter. I'm going to be reading portions of the chapter as we go through. So what, what are the biblical principles from 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? Because Paul, Paul is going to address the Corinthians in terms of giving to the saints in Jerusalem. And what he's going to do is he's going to bring in the churches of Macedonia and Achaia and talk about their giving that's going to inspire the Corinthians to give. And what we're going to find out is the Corinthians were fairly rich and the Macedonians and the Achaeans were not. And so for those of you who are here today who I've heard people say this. I'm not picking anybody here, but I've heard people say in the past, well, I can't give because I don't have much. You're going to find out that's not true from 2 Corinthians. It has nothing to do with what we have. It's what's in our heart, okay? So let's look in verse 2. So he says, well, start in verse 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. This would be um, up near Spain, modern-day Spain, up there, Macedonia and Asia, minor. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So verse 2, the first principle that we can draw from Paul's writings is to give faithfully. Listen to what he says. In great ordeal of affliction. So the Macedonian believers, as they were giving to the saints for the offering that was going to go to the poor in Jerusalem, and Paul would be taking that offering as he passed through Corinth, and he would pick up their offering, and he would bring it down to the saints in Jerusalem who had needs. He says the people in Macedonia were in great affliction. Right? He says, in, in a great deal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their ability. And the phrase, the wealth of their ability, means out of faithfulness to God. So this is a group of people who didn't have much, who were poor themselves, who were giving to the poor. And so Paul says to the Corinthians who are rich, look, I want to show you that this group of people gave faithfully to God. 
no matter what their circumstances, they were giving out of an abundance of joy and out of their deep poverty, this overwhelming faithfulness and liberalness to God. That's amazing. All right? Then if you continue on in verse 3, Paul says to the Corinthians, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. And so what I drew out of the principle I drew out of this was they gave sacrificially, right? They gave not only according to their ability, they, go, they gave beyond their ability to give, their, their, their perceived ability to what they could give. They gave over and above that, I believe, they gave out of trust to God. They gave generously, and then I added one, they gave willingly. They gave of their own accord. Nobody came and twisted their arm and made them give. Matter of fact, you're going to see next in verse 4, which I think is absolutely beautiful. What an what a inspiration of these believers in Macedonia, even to us today. Listen to what Paul says next in verse 4. I, here's what I titled, they gave eagerly. They gave begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. Now, you can just see here right now Paul saying to the Macedonian believers, hey, listen, you don't have much, so you don't have to worry about giving to the saints in Jerusalem. You don't have to worry. You, you, he doesn't say it, but you can just see him say, no, 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 you, no not, I'm not asking you to give. You don't. And they're begging him. Paul, please, 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 we want to give. We want to give. Don't stop us from giving. Right? This goes against this fly-in-the-face attitude that I hear from a lot of Christians. Well, I can't give. Pastor, you don't know. I don't have much. I can't give much. This flies in the face of that. Paul says, no, these people were poor themselves, and they were begging to give. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if you draw any conviction from the Scripture at all, like me. When's the last time... I was begging to give to somebody who had a need, even though I may not have had much myself. Shame on me. Shame on me as a believer for not trusting God enough to say, Lord, I want to give. I know, I, I know it doesn't look like I can afford it, but I'm going to give anyway. I want to give eagerly, and you'll find out why. Let me give you a quick illustration, and she's not here today, but Zoe. Let me give you an illustration of Zoe who I believe exemplifies this principle in the most beautiful way. Y'all know she's beautiful on the outside, right? I had somebody say to me the other night, oh, she's so beautiful. How's she doing? She's so beautiful. But you don't understand that I think as beautiful as Zoe is on the outside, I think she's even more beautiful on the inside. I have always believed that, which means that she must be really beautiful on the inside because she's gorgeous on the outside. She is absolutely beautiful. But listen to this. Zoe was about seven or eight at the time. So this is probably roughly 10 years ago. And we were doing VBS at our church in Michigan. And she had a little piggy bank. And she came to us. I don't remember if it was Lisa or myself. But she came to one of us. And she, she had $15 in her piggy bank. Now, for us, 15 bucks isn't much, right? 15 bucks, we could, George, we could spend on who knows what. Wouldn't take, right? A, ga a couple gallons of gas, right, today? But for a 15-year-old, she didn't understand. I don't think, at first I didn't think she understood the value of money. But she said, out of the $15 in her piggy bank, she goes, Dad, I want to give 10 of that to the VBS offering. And you know what I said to her? Well, we need to sit down and I need to tell you about the value of money. Do you realize that you're giving away two-thirds of the money that you have in your piggy bank? I don't know where that came from, if it came from, you know, uh, gifts that she had received for her birthday or whatever. But it's like, you know, a seven-year-old, it's going to take you a long time to, you give 10, it's going to take you a long time to get that 10 back. So here I was lecturing on her of the value of money. And she's begging me, Dad, no, no, I want to give this $10. And I stopped, and in that moment I thought, you know what, Lord, who am I? Who am I to tell a young lady who is generous, who wants to give of her money to the work of the VBS? It was to buy Bibles for other kids. Oh, they needed the Bibles. I didn't need the $10. Can you see how, I, as a dad, I was put to shame? 
It was like, really, eagerly. This is the, this is the principle. This is the, the, the heart of the Macedonians. And again, Paul's trying to reach the Corinthians because they're a lot wealthier, and he's trying to get them to understand some things. Look, if they can do it, and they're eager about it, what about you? Verse 5. Says, and, and this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So the next principle was they gave worshipfully. They gave, before they ever gave their money, they gave themselves to God. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this, that unless we first give ourselves to God, as an act of worship in our lives, then putting money in this plate means absolutely nothing. We cannot disconnect ourselves from the act of worship back to God. Somehow, somehow, this, this money that I see in the plate in front of me is nothing but a, a piece of paper until it becomes given out of an act of worship. Then it becomes holy unto God and for his use. It's kind of like when we celebrate communion, which we're going to celebrate next week. As I stand up here and I look at the, the bread and the grape juice that Kathy has prepared for us, I look at it and go, it's just a piece of bread and a piece of grape juice. Until I understand the symbolism and the significance behind it, then it becomes holy. In the same way, what we have in our wallet becomes holy when we give ourselves first to God and to God's will. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but maybe we should practice this more often. Maybe as we put our offering into the plate so that it doesn't become mundane and routine and, and kind of separated from worship, maybe we should pray over our offering individually and say, God, I'm going to take what I'm giving to you, and Lord, I'm going to ask that you multiply it like the loaves and the fishes. I'm going to ask, Lord, that you use it in a way that will have eternal value. And I think about, who knows what money we might have put in the plate this morning that's going to reach people this Thursday for Trunk and Treat. You know what? That money becomes holy because it becomes eternal in the sense of doing God's will. What if our attitudes became like that in terms of giving? Continuing, well, and, and let me just read this real quickly. Philippians 4, 19. By the way, am I moving fast? Yeah. Yeah but I'm trying to slow down enough so that we understand what Paul's trying to say. Philippians 4.19, I love this. If you go to Philippians 4.19, um, Paul's talking about their giving to him and how they were so gracious in giving to him that they were one of the few churches that supported him financially. He was a tent maker, and he went and worked with his own hands so he could minister to people. But the Philippians, one of the few people that gave to him, and Paul wrote them and thanked them in so many incredible ways. And listen to what he says uh, in verse 19. And my God, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What Paul's saying to them, and I think what he's saying about them is, God's going to provide their needs as they give worshipfully. God will provide all of our needs as we give out of a grateful heart. And then jump ahead in Corinthians. Uh, jump ahead to verse 7. Like I said, I'm not going to touch every scripture, but jumping ahead to 7. He says this, but just as you abounded in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in love, we inspire in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. He's saying abound, give excellingly, give aboundingly, without measure. And if you look at the scripture carefully, he says, see to it that you abound in this gracious work also. Did, by the way, did you know from Scripture that giving is an act of God's grace? It's a response to God's gracious work in our life, and it becomes grace in the lives of others as we give to them. So as we give to people in their need, we are actually extending grace to them from God. If that's the case, how do you separate giving 
from, from our walk with God. You don't. It's an act of grace. And by the way, let me ask you a question just real quickly. Has anybody in here ever received a gift from a fellow believer? Any form of gift? Money? Raise your hand if you have. Have you ever given a gift to somebody else? Do you know that's an act of grace through you? That's what he's saying. This is a gracious work. Wow. When you understand it that way, it makes giving a little, it gives you a different perspective on giving, right? Because here's the reality. I wish I had my wallet on me. But if I were to pull my wallet out and open it up, I look at that and go, that's mine. That's mine. I don't know about you, I'll, I'll confess to you this morning, I'm pretty selfish when it comes to money. That's mine, I worked hard for it, and I also have been, I've also been burned by people that I've lent money to who have never paid me back, and so I'm now a lot more cautious about who I give to, and my heart has gotten a little harder, and you need to pray for that, because God, I don't want to be that way, but the reality is, in my flesh, I look at that and go, that's mine. But if I understand what Paul's saying in these words, I'm going, no, 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 no. That's passing through your hands. That's a gift of grace. Either to give to the work of the ministry or to give to somebody else has a need. And if I understand that perspective, it changes who I am in terms of the way I give. I give it excellingly, right? And then if you go on to verse 11, He's talking to them about their giving to the saints. He says, but now finish doing it also. So he says, he says in verse 10, look, we talked about it a year ago, and you had a desire to do it back a year ago, but now finish doing it. So, that there, so just as there was a readiness to desire it, so there may also be the completion of it by your ability. So, so this principle in in this verse 11 is we give readily and completely right how many of you have ever made a, a pledge in your heart i'm going to do this i'm going to give this to somebody and then a month goes by and a year goes by and two years go by and you still haven't done it see paul's excited about their, their they've talked about giving for the work of the the, the saints in jerusalem but he's challenging the Corinthians, you've not completed it. It's, it's one thing to say, I want to do it. It's another thing to carry through with it, right? See, we can have a desire, but a desire doesn't help anybody. By the way, am I the only one that feels guilty about, I've said in the past that I would help somebody and then never did it? Why? Why don't I? Why don't I follow through with it? What's the motive of my heart? Am I trying to impress somebody by saying I'll help them and then don't? What's the motive of my heart? Instead of saying, okay, I was ready, I had the desire, okay, let's follow through with it. And that's what he's saying is be readily and completely give that way. And then continuing on in verse 12, he says, for if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Now, this almost looks like a contradiction to what he said earlier in verse 3 about according to their ability. They gave beyond their ability. But look, he says, if the ready is the present, if, 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 if you're ready to do it, it's acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he doesn't have. And I've heard people say, well, I can't give what I don't have. Good, you're right. Don't give what you don't have. I truly believe that God doesn't want us to max out our credit cards to help somebody else. I, I believe that. And I've heard, you know, you've heard some of these goofy preachers on TV that call you to slap on your credit card, go and give so God will bless. Be careful of them. Be careful of them. I don't believe that God wants us to go into debt to give to people. I think that's the caution here. Now, if we entrust, feel like, we're led by the Lord to give even over and above what we think we can give, knowing that God will supply our needs and we trust him. That's one thing. But don't be foolish in your giving. Don't max out your credit card. Don't give money to people when you, can't even, you don't even have food for your own table. 
I think that's what Paul, Paul's trying to say. Be cautious. Be cautious. Give accordingly. Give a pro, a proportionately. Give within our means. Right? God, um, we're not asked by God to go into debt. And, and, and if you're like me, how many in here wishes they had more money so they could give more? Anybody, anybody ever felt that way? Lord, I wish I had more money. I wish you had given me more money. Why? Not so I can hoard it because I want to give more. So Lord, why didn't you give me more? And here's the reality. God doesn't want me to go into debt to give because I have a soft heart for people, which I do, right? Which is what gets me in trouble, Lisa. Which is why when people come to me and wanna, want me to loan me them money, what do I normally do? I can't say no. I give it to them. Then I grumble later because they don't pay me back right? That's the reality. But I really do have a soft heart to want to give to people. And it's like, Lord, I wish you would give me more so that I could give more. But God's not asking us to. God says, look, I know what, you're, I know what you have to live on. I know what your finances are. I know what I've given you. I want you to be a wise steward, and I want you to give within those means. I'm not asking you to give to every organization. I'm not asking you to give to every person that you can Right? Because the, the need would never run out. But I want you to be part of that giving. I want you to give what you can to those that you feel like you can give to. Don't feel like you have to give to the whole world, Jim. Give to those that God has put on your heart. And I think that's what he's saying here. Right? And, 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 and Luke 21, 3 through 4 comes to mind. If you don't know it, Luke 21, 3 through 4, is the widow's might. Now watch this. She gave according to her means. She gave according to her means. She gave. She didn't give away what she didn't have. She gave away all she had. That's different. Right? She didn't give beyond her means. She gave all she had. Why? Because she trusted God, and that was her act of worship. But look at verses 13 through 15. 13 through 15 are beautiful sets of scriptures that most of us miss. Most of us don't understand in the context of the church. He says, look, this giving, this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for their needs. So what he's talking about, your abundance, the, the overabundance that you have that you're willing to give as Corinthians, because you've got over an abundance, will meet their need. The need he's talking about is, is for the saints in Jerusalem so that their abundance also may be a supply for your need that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much and he who gathered little had no lack. And I think, really, this is such a beautiful thing. I think what Paul's saying here is we give for equality's sake. Right? I believe 13 through 15 is God's plan for distributing wealth in the church. And what Paul's saying is we need each other. We need each other. Have you ever wondered why we all don't have the same amount of money to live on as Christians? Isn't it interesting that we all don't have the same, you know, let's say $50,000 to live on exactly to the penny, the same amount? It's for this reason. God's given more to some people in the body to share with others who don't have as much. And their need becomes our dependence. We depend on each other in the body. It's God's way of redistributing wealth in the body. Have you ever thought about it that way? It's absolutely amazing. Somebody has something that I have and they need, I give it to them, right? And think about it. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than receive, right? If I have something that somebody else needs and God wants me to give it to them, he's trusting me to let it go through my hands to give to their need, who's blessed by that? Not just them. So they need me, but also I need them because I need to be able to have somebody to give to that God has called me to give to. Isn't that a beautiful, beautiful concept? I absolutely love it. Okay, right, jumping over to 2 Corinthians 9. Verse 2. 
he continues on in this discussion about giving to them. He talks about the Macedonians again. For verse 2, he says, For I know your readiness, he's talking to the Corinthians, I know you're ready to give, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians. So he says, listen, I've talked to the Macedonians, and I keep bragging on you that you want to give. Namely, that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred mo up most of them. What he's saying is we give zealously and inspirationally. Our giving can inspire others to give. He's saying, look, they know you want to give. They're inspired by your giving, so now they want to give more. Can you see how it can kind of become a, a domino effect? Oh, you gave? Oh, I want to give, right? So we can inspire, inspirationally, we can inspire others to give, right? And that's a tricky one because the Bible says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. So one of the things we shouldn't be doing is out there bragging about how much I give. Well, George, I give this much. How much do you get? No, that's not what it's about. But somehow, somehow we can inspire each other to give um, because it's, what, it's, gonna, it's the domino effect. It's going to cause others to want to give, right? This shouldn't be our motive, but, okay. So secondly, we look at they give uh, bountifully. In verse 6. Now this I say. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now Paul uses the, the law, the Old Testament law of uh, sowing and reaping in Galatians. But in terms of spiritual things. Like if you sow like this spiritually, this is what you're going to get. Which means if you sow in sin, you're going to get the consequence of sin. If you sow to the Lord, you're going to receive the rewards from the Lord. That's not the way he uses it here. He uses it in context to talk about giving to the saints. And so he wants us to sow bountifully. He says, look, if you, if you sow bountifully, you're going, to, you're going to expect a bounty back. God's going to give to you. So if you give to the saints, you don't have to worry about God giving you back over in abundance. But if, you, if you're cheap then don't expect a whole lot from God on the other side. Now, may this never be our motivation, but may it be our reality to know that if we're going to give bountifully, we can trust that the Lord will be bountiful back to us. But if we give little, we're not going to get that in return. The Lord is in, in control of this whole process. Look at the next one in 7. Purposefully and joyfully. Each man must do just as he is perfect in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We have to give intentionally. We have to give as we've purposed. Okay? Let me just say this. What does that mean? That means you need to think about what you're going to give before you give it. You need to think about how intentional you need to be about giving. And then he goes on to say, and not grudgingly or not grievingly, like, okay, I gave, but I really didn't want to. And one of the things I've said in the past is, God would rather us not give in the offering plate if that's, or, or to give to somebody if we're going to do it grudgingly. You ever done that? You, you had your heart stirred to give somebody something, and then you gave it to them only wishing that you had it back? I, am I the only one in here that's ever felt that way? Thank you. Thank you for letting me off the hook this morning, right? That's not what God wants. God wants us to release that money, let it go joyfully, and say, that's what I intended to give them, and you know what? I'm not going to worry about it because I know God's going to give me what I need. He will take care of my needs as I help take care of the needs of my brothers and sisters in the body. I'm going to end right there today. I'm going to end right there. I left you with some things to go back and look at. And I'll just share real briefly. Uh, the last point I had was knowingly. Right? And the things that we can know in verses 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Those are things that we need to know as we give. And actually, I want to end on 1 Corinthians 16 real quickly. Because I think this is really important. And I don't want to miss this. So back in 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to them about giving as well. 
And he's talking about the same thing that he would have written to them later on in verses, in chapters 8 and 9. 16, 1 and 2, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, and that's the, that's the collection he's going to take to bring to Jerusalem to give to those saints who have needs. I directed the church of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, one of, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. They didn't have to take offerings. They had, they had money set aside. In a sense, they had a fund set aside for the saints, for the collection of the saints. So what he's saying is at the beginning of each week, take an amount, be purposeful about it. I think you should be prayerful about it. Set it aside and put it aside so that each one in the body has money toward this collection fund so that when Paul comes, all that money can be given to Paul to take to the saints. I shouldn't have to take a collection. I'm going to challenge this with something. A number of years ago, and I probably need to get back to this, but a number of years ago, God put this principle on my heart. And I had a little bit more money than I normally did. But what I did is I, I took money and I put it into a bank account. And I had a separate bank account, in the, actually in the credit union. And I put money in there. And each, each paycheck, every two weeks I got paid, I would set an amount and put it in that fund. Usually $50 out of every paycheck I put into the fund. And so the fund began to build up. And so I would have, because you've heard me say this before, when people usually have a need, it's not, I need five bucks. It's usually, I need 500 bucks, right? And I've always struggled with not having enough money to give them. I wanted to give them more, but I couldn't. So I did what the scripture said to do, and I had built up an account well over $1,000 so that when people came to me and needed money and had legitimate needs in the body, I could write them a check. Moo, if you, if, you, if you came to me and said, Pastor, I can't meet my bills, Moo, let me write you a check for 500 bucks. Here, go. Take care of your bills. Another man in the church, I, and I wasn't advertising this, but another man in the church found that I was doing that and said, I came into a couple thousand dollars and I want to add to that account. We were able, over the course of a couple of years, we actually went through the account, and the account finally got drained, and I never got back to it. But we went through that, and we were able to give to people as they had a need, based on the principle of, of 1 Corinthians 16. Can you imagine starting a fund, and out of your paycheck, every paycheck, you put in a little bit of amount, a little bit of amount, a little bit of amount, so that if there's a need in the body, and God has put it in your heart to help them, you can do that. Brothers and sisters, last week we looked at giving for the work of the ministry. And the reality is this. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what God's doing here. Are you? If we are going to continue to be the church and grow to be the church that God wants us to be, we have got to step up to the plate with our finances. If you listen, if you listen to Kim and you listen to her talk, and she's not, she's not a panicker. She's not panicking. She's, she's, she understands. She's, she's very grateful for how God has blessed us. But she's also realistic enough to say, we've got we've to up our giving. And I know we're small. And, and we pray that as more people come in, God will, you know, bring more in and, and, and bless us with more. But we have to give the way God wants us to for the work of the ministry. But part of giving isn't just giving in the offering play. Part of God's way of giving is to redistribute wealth in the body so that people don't have needs. And I'm, I'm here to tell you today, I'm as guilty as anybody else here today. I struggle with giving. I struggle with letting that money go out of my hands for a variety of reasons in this, the way that you might. But I want to be obedient to the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to give? What do you want me to give to the work of the ministry? What do you want me to give to the needs of the saints? Because I know we have people in our midst that have needs. And then next week, we're going to look at um, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at what our giving says about us spiritually. And I'm looking forward to that message. But it's a hard one because, and I'm just going to say this and I'll close this in prayer and then we'll, we'll sing our last song. 
This is a difficult subject to talk about in the church, but it's a needed subject to talk about. Why? Because the Bible talks about it. And I would not be a faithful servant of God and a faithful preacher of God's word if I didn't tell you what the word says about it. And then allow the Holy Spirit to do his work. Because here's the reality. I can't make you give. You, you do realize that, right? The pastor has authority, but I don't have the right to tell you what to give. I don't have a right to make you give anything. God has to be the one to show us what we need to give. And so my prayer is that as I'm planting the seeds here, God is doing his work and stirring us up to say, how can we together as a body, and, and you know this, right? You know this. One person in this church financially can't help this church continue on. You, you do know that, right? Nobody's wealthy enough in this church to make this church go by, by one person, right? And I'm grateful for that because oftentimes churches get in trouble when people who give a lot of money, then they begin to demand what they want and what, you know, and they can tell the pastor what they can preach and all that. I don't want that. So I'm glad we don't have that here. But we do know as a family, as a body, God's going to take what each of us has, pool it together so that we can grow and go forward to be the kind of church that God wants us to be. And so all we're asking is that we all pray about as we get ready to pledge in the first part of December and pledge Sunday, as we all get ready to think about what it is that God really wants us to give to for our contribution to the body so that we can be the church that God wants us to be. How many of us want us to grow? Anybody want the church to grow? How many of us want to reach those people out there who don't know Jesus with the gospel, like through trunk and treat and other? Well, the reality is it takes money to do that, right? And God has given us what we need. If we'll let, release it back to him, we'll have what we need and do the ministry God's called us to for, for years to come, right? Because I'm not going anywhere, Julie, unless what? Unless the Lord takes me home. Right? We were talking about that this morning. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere unless the Lord takes me home. But in the meantime, we have a future. We, have, we want to go forward. And this is what the challenge for all of us in the body, to accept that challenge together and to work as one unit to be what God wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, even on the issue of finances, Lord, which seems to be like that taboo subject in the church. But Lord, you spoke of it so often in your word. And Lord, forgive us preachers for not talking about it, to not educate us and the body for what your word says. And Lord, I'm not here today to guilt anybody. I'm not here to twist anybody's arm. I'm simply here to present the truth of your word. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will take that truth in our lives and work it in such a way that we become the kind of givers that are faithful to you, that give to other people's needs, that don't do it grudgingly, that do it joyfully, and even beg to be able to give, Lord. Father, we want to be the kind of people that please you, not only in the way we walk with you in, our, in terms of holiness, but also the way we walk with you in terms of the stewardship of your finances, Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts in these weeks. And, Father, show us what you want us to do. And I pray more than anything that we would have a spirit of trust. That if you ask us to go over and above what we think we can afford, that we'll trust you, Lord. That you'll bless us. That we'll know that if we sow bountifully, we'll reap bountifully. Because you're a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And it would be nothing for you to give us 10, 20, 50 times more than we have now. That would be nothing for you. Lord, help us to trust you in all of this for your honor, your glory, and the good of not only this church, but the good of those who need to hear the gospel. We ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name.